name is Frank Rademacher, and I'm from Gifford, Illinois. Today we're talking about the fall covers for spring savings, cover crop premium discount program. I'm interested, how did you first learn about this program and what made you want to apply for it? We're a part of several organizations and heard it through some of those. Primarily, I think it was through Practical, Practical Farmers of Iowa. Um, I know they've got a program similar over there that, that the Illinois program was based on. And then we're also part of Illinois Stewardship Alliance, and they were promoting it pretty heavily at the time also. And we ended up um, applying for it because we're kind of at a stage in cover crops that we don't really uh, qualify for a lot of the early financial help. And so uh, this is just a nice little program that, that we were able to, to apply for. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, you know, it's this is its second year that it's in the IDO budget, and so we're really excited because um, we just recently learned that within the first 24 hours, the first day that the whole program was filled, which is awesome because last year, I, I believe it took maybe around two weeks, and so I think it's really bringing light to like how important this program is and oh, how many people want sure. to apply. It's been great to to see that kind of response. I know it kind of has a reputation now for like, if you want it, you better be on top of your paperwork and timing. That's awesome. So diving right into you, how, how have you used cover crops in the past? How many years have you been using it? And what has been <laughs> positive or negative about it? Sure, so we started, um, this was before I was involved, um, right when dad got involved they went to a soil and water Conser conservation district meeting mm -hmm. and just learned about it and it sounded interesting and so they started on real real small scale just around the farm on the toughest piece of ground that they could um, kind of with the mindset that if, if they could make it work here they could just about make it work anywhere it's been about eight years then and so we started out just winter kill continuous note we got into no-till continuous on the that piece and winter kill cover crops and flying it on and then as the years have, have gone by we've really ramped up how aggressive those practices are when i got involved because we knew we would need to have some more income we got a little more aggressive in our practices i believe it was 2017 and we switched the whole farm over to continuous no-till and cover crops and non-gmo and started cutting fertilizer and certain pesticides Wow. Um, so yeah, I mean, at this point we have our own drill. Um, so we do drill everything. Uh, we plant shorter maturity crops to get cover crops more time to grow and we're planting green um, mm -hmm. into high biomass and using a, a roller crimper now. So wow. You're yeah, using the whole suite of practices. Yeah, <laughs> we, we are deep in it now, but oh, it's, it's been great. So what is the total amount of acreage that you have then? So we're at like 570 or so. I think about these practices, is this costing your farm money at this point? I, you know, I think a lot of times with cover crops, there's that upfront cost, you know, whether that's like you already have, but you know, there's investing in, in, in equipment, you know, there's trying to find equipment to rent out. Um, there's, you know, maybe planting some cereal rye, but not knowing when to terminate it. So, so I guess from your standpoint, maybe like split into two halves, like the first four years, did it cost you a lot of money? And now these first, or these last four years, have you, you know, broke even or like, are you actually seeing more money? Yeah, the first years, first years are definitely difficult um, yeah. for a lot of reasons. I mean, just one is mindset. I mean, you were trying, you're going from what is normal one day and not normal the next. It's, it's weird to plant into residue where I have to kill something early or be planting something after harvest. I mean, that's something to, to get used to. And then how do you manage that? You know, how much are you spending on seed or when are you planting it? And um, so, yeah, there's there's certainly that learning curve initially is tough, but there's also mm -hmm. it comes with increased costs because you are gonna mess some things up or pay too much or too little for something or do something at the wrong time, or you need to get a different piece of equipment. Maybe you, um, like like a planter attachment, maybe you need to um, invest a little more in row cleaners or closing wheels. So that initially there's there is a lot of cost there. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's pretty easily made up in other ways, and it doesn't have to be a high cost. Certainly, all your line items that you're spending money on, 
and which of those down the line um, can you reduce because of cover crops? And that's, you have to be looking forward and that's how we took it. So yeah, early years are a little tougher, um, but really once you get into, I think we've had a huge financial benefit to, to cover crops and no-till for sure. I love asking this question. When did you see, like visually see your soil change after how many years? Those physical changes, I think you see it faster on better soils. They just mm -hmm. seem to, to take it up a lot, a lot quicker. The tougher soils that we started, I mean, it's, it's still a process. I mean, they are just naturally, they don't, they don't drain well. That's, that's the biggest struggle there for sure. But that takes some time. We've, I think with cover crops, that shortens that, that, um, that time, that transition time quite a bit. I think in the first, even year one, I think you can see changing tilt and that kind of thing. Um, oh, yeah. but that only expands. I think year three is kind of a good, that's kind of a good thing to shoot for is really mm -hmm. when it kind of comes together in my opinion. You do definitely see right off the bat, but sure. But yeah, to be able to just, when you drive down the road and you know, the water coming off your neighbor is, they're just huge amounts of it and it's brown and, and you yeah. don't have any water or when it finally does, it's clear. I mean, once you get to that kind of stage, it's really cool. And that, that's usually going to take a couple of years, but yeah, things like that are just great to see. So, so of your inputs, like fertilizer inputs, have, have that reduced over the oh, years? Yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have stopped all dry fertilizer. Um, wow. Yeah, that's one of those hazy areas where I honestly can't tell you. And there's a lot of split research on on that. So we still do soil samples um, just to kind of try and track it. So yeah, we are carefully cutting those things out. I don't see anything to be concerned about right now. Um, mm -hmm. So we've done that. Nitrogen, we've cut about 20% from our before this levels, we're, we're down to about 150 pounds versus about 180 is mm. where we were at before. Long term, I'd like to get down to like 100 would be kind of nice, but that's going to take some real production system changes for sure. Um, hoping to use cover crops to uh, offset some of that synthetic nitrogen. As far as other synthetics, like I said, we'll, we'll be finished with insecticides this year. Um, so that means no, no seed treatment, no foliar sprays of insecticides. Soybeans are all untreated right now, unless there's an, I, I scout a lot during the season and unless mm -hmm. there's a, a problem that meets a threshold, we're not going to spray crops obviously for, mm -hmm. um, for fungicide or insecticide. And then, um, herbicides a little tougher. <laughs> that's, that's the tough one. Um, cause you really see that when you screw yeah. that one up. But last year we got down to one herbicide pass on soybeans um, rather than two, which I think is pretty great. Yeah. Um, not all the acres were successful and you could pick those out pretty easy, but, <laughs> but we, I think going forward, we'll continue to improve that. And I think that's reliable. Talking about inputs, what, what have your yields been like then, you know, comparing over the past years? 2019 was hard. It was mm -hmm. such a wet spring. Uh, we planted, I think we planted in June and then we didn't have any rain for three months at the end of the season. Mm. And then after 2019, we said, well, surely 2020 can't be worse. Well, mm. it was basically the same format. And so the last couple of, I think now that we on a broad basis are past that three to five acre or three to five year transition period, mm -hmm. it'll be nice to see. We, don't, we haven't had really a yield that's normal within yeah. that. Do you know what I'm saying? It's so it's hard. I, mean, I am excited. I think we'll do excellent. Um, For sure. But I think, um, but this is my favorite story, is that, um, <laughs> so we did like 190 bushels of corn this year average, I think. Mm -hmm. And we're close with another operation. We share costs and how'd you do all that kind of stuff, which is fun. Yeah. And so we made 190 bushels. They did really well and did 250. Um, wow. Better soils, pattern tile. It was, they did, they did really well. And I think we matched their profit on what for us was a bad year. So 
I'm really excited that give just give us a, a normal year normal if there's that <laughs> such thing anymore but we're I think we'll be able to keep up well on yields. How do you prepare yourself to make these long-term changes and and work around them? You know, like how do you handle the stressors? How do you move past that hump? Like how do you just keep moving forward even though something might have failed? It's difficult because like I'm I'm 25 and I yeah. plan on doing this for like I mean I 40 years, you know, 50 years. And so I have to be looking ahead and saying, what does agriculture look like in 10, 20, 30 years from now? And yeah. I mean, it doesn't take a genius to figure out some of the trends that that we're seeing. I mean, you're going to see a lot of work in the next decade on climate and environmental issues. What do consumers want? I think we're going to see the trend continue towards um, non-GMO and organic. And so if even if the, the early years are tough and we have some failures and oops, there's some weeds, oops, that maybe didn't do as well of an experiment as I thought, um, that long-term strength, I think, is absolutely worth a few short-term struggles for sure. What are your words of wisdom for the future of farming and those looking to start new practices how how should they get started? You know, like whether that's finding a mentor, um, you know, reading something in particular. What are what are those thoughts that you have? Yeah, for people interested in, in starting things, I think it's important to um, to again look at the trends and where you see farming going in in the future, and that may look different for everybody and for every operation. So if you are wanting to get started now, is a great time because somewhere down the line, if there is legislation surrounding this, um, you don't want to be experimenting then. You'd like to do it now when you've got, when there's a little better op opportunity for funding, for example. There's a lot of opportunities now, but there may not be as that demand picks up. So now is a good time. Uh, you can start out slow. Um, I found that the, a lot of the taboo surrounding this has been lifted. So it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a good thing now if you're trying. I think a lot of landlords support that for sure. Um, and how you get started, yeah, find somebody hopefully in the area who, who's doing what you want to do or, or someone you feel you can ask questions to. Um, I think the, the best place to start out is, is usually with a head of beans. They're a little more forgiving um, and it's a little cheaper to use something like cereal rye head of beans and it's, it's really easy to manage um, compared to other options in, in front of corn. So that's a good place just to start. Um, but yeah, reach out to the local uh, soil and water board, just anybody you can think of that um, that supports this and, and would be willing to help. That's awesome. That's really great. Uh, and find um, different partners too, like you did, you know, put yourself in that space to find those people. And I think it's, it's much better to understand what's going on when you're surrounded by those who understand as well. Sure. Yeah.